we don't normally keep the video on in the control room when we're flying because the video can deceive you. The truth is in the telemetry. But when all the data went away and we heard the reports from the site of an explosion, everybody turned their cameras on and almost turned on the video. And almost everybody um, that I've talked to said, uh, I kept looking in that cloud for an orbiter to fly out because we were thinking that we'd find a way to bring them back if an orbiter would fly out of the cloud. And of course, it didn't happen that day. I watched the ascent. I saw the fireball. Um, I screamed, please return to the launch site. I ran to the TV set, I turned the TV set on and um, waited with the rest of the country as they played that fireball over and over again. Uh, I knew those people and I recall the last time at which I saw every one of them. When did I look in, in their eyes? When, what were the last words that were communicated between myself and each one of them? That kind of played through my head the last time uh, that I saw them, what the occasion was and what we spoke of, and I remember the expression on their faces. The films told us that the crew module came out more or less intact. We didn't get enough detail to determine what kind of intactness there was. For example, what, if the crew was still conscious or not conscious, able to make radio calls or not, that part we never really did determine. But we did not expect to see the crew module come out as one piece and be able to track it for some distance. I knew we were dealing with a very vulnerable vehicle, a butterfly, which is riding on a rocket. I knew about those things. I knew it was vulnerable. I knew it was fragile. And I knew the risk was very high on this thing. But uh, I did not expect when the accident occurred that it would be due to negligence. It could have been prevented. It didn't have to happen. It wasn't one of those days where all the forces of nature ganged up against us. That the system, the people in the system, understood that we had a problem in the design of the O-rings, that a potential could occur for a uh, loss of the vehicle due to burn through of the casing. But somehow we, we were unable to work the system properly to get those answers up so that we could take effective action. And so it was a human failing. And uh, I'll never forget that moment. Every time I go through the Denver airport, I know. Then when you get to countdown, it never gets to be routine. <laughs> it never gets to be old hat. You can't help as a human being not to have that nagging feeling that have you ever done enough? You know, have you ever really done enough? At this point, our forecasters are predicting only a 20% chance of violating our launch constraints at that particular time, and uh, only a 20% chance of violating... Good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Talon. Have a good day. Thank you. You all have a good evening. Okay. Window. Get it up. All right. We expect to have some scattered clouds. Everything else is on schedule. We're going to launch at 8.07 hours. The window extends to 13.09. Let's hope it goes on time. I showed you what it's like. We've loaded the tank and we're we're replenishing it, keeping up with what we call the heat leak because it's not a perfect thermos bottle. So we have to keep adding a couple hundred gallons a minute of hydrogen and oxygen to the tank. This is shuttle launch control of T-minus three hours and holding. Crew preparing to have the mission cape with the STS-59 mission end will monitor. Shuttle launch control, approximately 
one hour and 11 minutes remaining in this built-in hole. The ice team is at the pad doing their inspections at this time and is reporting some limited ice found on the external tank. Commander C. Gutierrez, pilot Kevin Chilton, and there's our uh, payload commander, Linda Godwin. It is a strange thing. You, you, you do all this sophisticated training, you have all these people who do all this high-tech preparation, but it really does come down to a few people who take you in a bus out to the launch pad. They do strap you into this vehicle, uh, and then you know that anybody in their right mind gets way the hell back away from this thing, at least three miles, and leaves you alone out there with all of this high explosives and uh, makes you think very hard about doing this job. Now on the way to launch pad 39A, There is a ceremony, and I think it's a ceremony that, that, that we need as human beings. So we need ceremony, and, and I think in this case, these are emissaries that we're sending out into space. Yeah, well, and the excitement in the bus kind of builds, too, as we're coming down. I can remember going out and, and people saying, OK, one more corner. Oh, you know, look at that. Isn't it marvelous? Normally, you're used to arriving at the pad and finding all these workers, you know, scurrying all over the place, readying the vehicle for flight or readying the pad. And suddenly, you get out there, and there's just the six of you on the crew and the six members of the team that are going to help strap you in and do the final hatch closing. And that's it. Those are the only human beings out there. And this. Uh, and this big, beautiful rocket ship. We're at the 195-foot level of the tower. The crew module's right here. There's a, the external tank is not more than 20 feet to this side, and there's a solid rocket booster that's loaded and ready to go that's right next to it. So we're right in the middle of it. All of that's full, and we've got about a million gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen right there ready to go. So <laughs> you're one of a dozen people that you're out here, and everybody else is four miles away. This is shuttle launch control at T minus two hours, six minutes. Mission specialist Tom Jones is now being prepared for first boarding endeavor. There you go. Okay, we got you now. At this point, you're kind of numb to the whole thing, I think. You're just uh, excited a bit. Looking forward to getting in and strapped in and settled down. And it's a bit uncomfortable like this. Kind of laying on some valves in the back of the suit. But uh, it's not too bad uh, for the first hour and a half or two. As you approach the, a little after that, you start getting a little uncomfortable with uh, sometimes the back pain. So the quickest way to get comfortable is to launch. You know? <laughs> if you scrub, it's, it takes about 40 minutes to get back out here and open the hatch and take you back. But if you launch, it's only eight and a half minutes to zero G. So <laughs> that's the most comfortable end of the deal. Beans have become such a trademark to what we do here. It was like fish and loaves. There couldn't have been enough to go around, and it grew and it grew, and and now it's a tradition, and we feel like the beans are part of our, our luck, and the beans are also a part of the celebration. 